hunt with the weapon that you took to battle with your enemies. And all you're doing is you're not training it to do anything. All you're doing is just borrowing its normal hunting technique. Kings, the emperors, the aristocrats of medieval Europe mostly hunted, mainly because it was a lot of fun. I'm engaged in one of the most restful and peaceful pursuits I know, fishing for trout on an English river. And if I catch a big enough fish, I'll cook it and eat it. Because what I'm actually doing is hunting. Now, for most of us today, hunting is just a sport. We don't need to do it. There are much more efficient ways for us to get our food. We do it because we enjoy it. But why is it enjoyable? Whatever the answer, there is no doubt that we humans have hunted throughout our history for food, for prestige, for pleasure, and for training for the rigors of war. Our earliest ancestors lived alongside animals in a mysterious and hostile world. Man's choice was to hunt or go hungry. So he had to learn quickly to be a good predator to survive. He used his developing intelligence to track animals and trap them for his own needs. Well, early people had to hunt to live, and they had no choice. They needed meat, and particularly when people came into Europe, the climates were often colder than the present day. They were basically tropically adapted. They'd come from Africa, and they were moving into a place that was very seasonal, that had long winters, long cold winters when the plant resources just wouldn't have been there a lot of the time. So people really needed to be able to hunt or at least scavenge efficiently to eat meat in order to survive at all in places like that. Once a man had realized that eating meat helped him to survive, he had to become a better hunter to feed himself and the tribe. He developed weapons to increase his strength, simple at first, made from wood, bone and stone. He learnt to find, chase and outwit his prey. And as he grew to understand their habits and behaviour, he was able to devise better means to hunt larger and more dangerous animals. Once people were hunting large mammals regularly, they really did need to be uh, well organised. This implies they had probably a basic communication system to plan their hunts. And when they were actually hunting these dangerous animals, they must have had a plan of campaign, how to go about it effectively to avoid uh, serious injuries and deaths uh, when they were doing this. These early hunters, well organized and experienced, were capable of driving and chasing large and dangerous prey. Hunting together was one of our ancestors' earliest social activities. They had to communicate and plan a strategy safely to secure the food they needed. Returning with meat for the tribe brought the hunters prestige. The kill was a moment to be celebrated. Food and materials for tools and clothes had been secured by chasing a wild animal and killing it but the death of the animal was by no means the end of the business. Even once they'd killed the animals, they would have had to have been well organized, not only in order to butcher the animals, but also to keep away uh, the other animals that would have been interested. So organization even before the hunt, during the hunt, and then afterwards to secure the carcass and keep the other mammals at bay. Driving an unpredictable and dangerous animal like a wild pig into a pit was a reasonably efficient way of hunting animals for food. There was much less energy spent on the chase and much more use of trapping skills, better suited to man's natural talents and intelligence as an observer and exploiter of his own environment. Man has always trapped, I think from the earliest times, whether it was primitive man driving animals by the use of fire over cliffs or into canyons in which they then drop things on them um, or into even a simple pit in which the animal fell. But man's ingenuity at trapping wild animals quickly extended beyond simply driving them into pits bedded with sharp sticks. 
He soon learnt to make a range of traps for a variety of different sized animals. This type of trap demonstrates the principle of deadfall. It can be made small enough to catch squirrels or big enough to catch bear. In this case, it's set to catch squirrels with a piece of dried fungus, which attracts the squirrel. It works on the trigger principle, but they come in different forms. The animal comes along, tries to take the bait, and is crushed to death as the logs fall on it. Trapping is a very simple way of hunting. It appears simple, but you have to be very good in, in wood law, understanding the animals, the environment in which they live. You can make string out of nettle fibers that are twisted together to make this fine twine. Then by twisting it again and again, you can make a thicker cord in which you can make a snare. But you have to have the skills to do this. People in the past may be primitive, but their technology was pretty good for what they wanted to do. This type of trap is a snare. The difference between this and other snares is that we use the power in a branch to help in the killing of the animal. The spring of the branch goes back, as you'll see, and helps to strangle the animal. You have it set with a noose, which is attached to a trigger. We'll set the trigger firmly at the moment so it doesn't go off. It's set on a run. This type is from a rabbit burrow. And to help the rabbit come out when it comes in the evening to feed, we put little, little branches to make sure it runs on the correct run. When it's, all of that is done, we set the snare loosely with the aid of two twigs at the right height so that when the rabbit comes through, he can put his head through the snare. When all that's done, we set the trigger very finely and then we go away. When the rabbit comes out in the evening or the early morning to feed, unaware of the snare, it comes in, pushes through, catches its neck, dislodges the trigger, and is caught and is thrown up in the air. More importantly, being caught in the air strangles the animal much quicker and more humanely. Also, it keeps the animal up in the air away from other predators who might try and get the game that you're after. The snare is an ingenious and simple device, a clever trap designed to capture a wary and nervous animal. That is the trapper's skill. Trapping has the advantage that you can do it on your own. You don't need the rest of the tribe to help you. In fact, probably in a tribe, all the different good hunters would trap in different areas, in, again, increasing the chance of catching more game for the village. Those early hunters had to provide meat for the tribe. But in time, they learnt to farm crops and husband animals. Nevertheless, hunting remained important. It still provided food, food with a difference, a welcome change from the normal diet. The thrill of the chase and the kill had also become a deeply ingrained part of the dominant male psychology. Hunting was how he proved his skills and status. By the Middle Ages in Europe, vast areas of forest and heath were preserved exclusively for the use of kings and nobles, whose consuming passion was hunting. From earliest times, hunters had always revered the animals they hunted. Through the chase and the kill, it was believed that some of the animal's virtues would attach themselves to the hunter. But those admired symbolic virtues didn't stop men from chasing and killing them for sport. By the Middle Ages, the stag had come to symbolize the gentle and noble savior, Jesus Christ. Nonetheless, it was still hunted. Hounds were specially bred with a highly developed sense of smell and then carefully trained to track deer. An experienced hunter could tell a great deal from the stag's droppings about the size, age and condition of the animal, and from this would choose which was the best stag to hunt. This was hunting to die for. This is the Rufus Stone. By tradition, it marks the site of one of the greatest unexplained mysteries of English history. For it was here in 1100 that William Rufus, King of England, son of William the Conqueror, was shot dead by one of his companions 
while hunting driven deer. The hunt that day was of the type known as a stable stand, in which the deer were driven towards the hunters who waited ready to shoot in pre-arranged positions. It was a type of hunting that was very popular with the aristocracy in the early Middle Ages. The king and his hunting party took up their positions. Once they were settled and ready with their weapons, longbows and crossbows, orders were given for the drive to begin. On the signal, the deer were beaten towards the waiting hunters. Hounds bark, horns are blown. The deer, scared by all the noise, were driven towards the royal party. The bowmen waited, hearing the noise of the drive closing. The king and his friends raised and then shot their bows. But in this hunt, it was not only a stag that received a fatal arrow. It was the king. It might have been an accident. Accidents do happen when using deadly weapons. Or it might have been a successful assassination plot. His younger brother Henry certainly had motive. His reward was the throne of England. We'll never know for certain. All we do know for certain is that the king was killed. Hunting has always been a dangerous sport. Deer offer tremendous sport and sometimes danger. But the best test of the hunter's courage is when he confronts far more dangerous and unpredictable beasts like bear and boar. For this, he has to be absolutely sure of himself and his weapon. If the stag was symbolic of everything good and Christly, then the boar became a symbol of the opposite, of absolute evil. It was terrible and wicked. In medieval illustrations, the boar's mouth is sometimes used to represent the entrance to hell. Despite, or perhaps because of these associations, hunting boar was popular throughout Europe during this period. The boar was good to eat, but it was also a difficult and dangerous animal to hunt. It posed real danger, an attractive quality that fully tested the hunter's courage and his weapons. Finding and pursuing the boar was organized with the precision of a military campaign. Good organization and issuing the right commands to those taking part was crucial to the success of the hunt. endurance and strength, the same qualities that were demanded on the battlefield. A large boar weighed over a hundred kilos and could run at high speed when chased. And if provoked, it could turn on a man or his horse and gore them with its ferocious tusks. But taking part in a boar hunt was emotionally and physically stimulating. The kill was the final test of hunter and weapon. If sword or spear failed at the moment of greatest danger, the hunter could be killed. As hunting developed, so too did hunting weapons. They became specialized tools made for a particular purpose. The spear, suitably modified, was well suited to dealing with a dangerous animal like the boar. Well, we think that the spear was probably one of the earliest weapons used by man, both in hunting and, of course, in warfare. And for many centuries, the two kinds of weapons were indistinguishable. You would hunt with the weapon that you took to battle with your enemies. There was no physical distinction. 
but add a crossbar, lugs or wings beneath the spear's head and you have a weapon that can kill a boar and at the same time protect the hunter. Let's say, for example, you're hunting wild pig. The pig is a very soft-bodied animal and unfortunately also very aggressive. So if you thrust your spear into the pig, there's a very good chance that before it expired, it would run up the spear shaft and attack you. So the lugs would prevent it doing you any damage. It was not just spears that were specially adapted for this sort of hunting. Look again at the sword that brings the boar down. It too has a crossbar near the tip of the blade. Like the spear, it has become a very specialized weapon designed specifically to kill boar and bear. But the death of the animal was not the end of the hunt. It continued with a number of important rituals to celebrate the occasion. It was important to reward the hounds. The hunters had chased and killed one beast with the help of another. Specially bred to either scent or drive the boar or deer, dogs were rewarded with the blood of the animal to keep up their interest in the chase. The dead animal became the centerpiece of a complicated hunting ritual called the unmaking. This began by setting aside some of the animal parts on a forked stick, and then the animal was carefully butchered. Often specially designed sets of implements were used that most resembled surgeons' instruments. Every tool had a special purpose for cutting, sawing, chopping, even sewing up the carcass. And because hunts were occasions for the rich to show off their wealth, these sets of unmaking tools were often sumptuously decorated. All these beautifully made and surprisingly delicate tools played their part in the unmaking. There was a similar set of butchering procedures for every animal, though each type was cut up differently. The rewarding of the hounds and the unmaking were usually carried out at the place of the kill. Everyone involved in a medieval hunt would have been part of the unmaking celebrations which preceded the feast. This was a social event, a party, a chance to dress up, to eat and drink. There was courtly love, good fellowship, conversation and music. And the dead animal and the butchering had a central role in the festivities. The first thing you took off it was its testicles, complete with the scrotum and these were the first thing to be hung on the forked stick. You then split it down the belly and up the legs, round the four hooves. You peel back the skin, revealing the carcass. You then proceeded to take out various parts of um, the more dainty parts of the carcass, such as the tongue, um, the heart, uh, strangely, the large intestine, all of which were conveyed as special titbits to the, uh, the forked stick. And then you butchered the thing in a specified sequence, taking off a limb at a time. Um, this is laid down in the manuals, and clearly it's part of the arcane knowledge that uh, a true medieval hunter needs. Hunters loved to display their wealth by showing off their stables of fine horses and packs of hounds. They hunted wearing their very best clothes, and for centuries they used the most expensive weapons. Weapons that were not only practical, they had to be, but were also decorated with evocative scenes of the hunt in superbly crafted detail. Hunting also interacted with the religious and intellectual aspects of life and with art and music. Hunters wanted to show their spiritual side too. There was a curious relationship at the heart of hunting. To hunt an animal successfully, man often needed other animals to help him. He relied on the speed of the horse and the scenting ability of the hounds to chase and catch his prey. And there was one other hunting animal that man used, the bird of prey, fast, free and a superbly efficient killer. An Elizabethan hunting party was also a social event. Here was an opportunity for the nobility to display their wealth, their finery, their good taste. 
and a chance for the men to show their expensive and decorated hunting weapons. It was also a chance to take out and exercise their favorite horses and hounds, and it was an occasion that combined fun and sport, usually followed by feasting and dancing. In the Middle Ages, hunting was a way of obtaining food, but more importantly, it was a way of entertaining oneself. The kings, the emperors, the aristocrats of medieval Europe mostly hunted as their primary physical entertainment. Uh, they did so for various reasons, but mainly because it was a lot of fun. Considered particularly good fun was hunting from horseback with trained falcons and hawks. These birds of prey hunted heron, partridge and pheasant on the wing at speed, something quite beyond man's capabilities. In falconry, a range of birds of prey was used to pursue different kinds of quarry. There was a very much a, a social hierarchy, which helped, I think, to reinforce the image that aristocrats had of their own social superiority. Uh, the peregrine, for instance, was always looked on as a bird of nobility. Its flight was noble, it rose higher than other birds. It had the right to live off other members of the, the bird population, rather as aristocrats did in their own environment. In the medieval world, hunting birds were specially bred and their nesting sites guarded, with terrible penalties for those caught trying to steal them. In parts of Europe, offenders were blinded. The men who trained medieval hunting birds were highly regarded in society, and skills with a hawk or falcon counted for a great deal. Hunting with birds was considered to be far more genteel than the pursuit of deer or the more dangerous sport of hunting wild boar. The only weapon here was the bird itself. Today at the Royal Armouries Museum Leeds, a modern falconer trains birds as they have been trained throughout history. The process of training requires time and patience and a real understanding of the bird's natural instincts. Falconry has been with us for around four and a half thousand years uh, and the main reason for, for using hawks was to uh, catch fast-moving prey that was very difficult to catch any other way. So using a bird of prey to do that was the, the logical thing to do. Birds of prey are normally sight motivated. They get their information through what they see. They've got very good eyesight and, uh, and, and you're using that sight and an appetite to, uh, to get your, your hunting weapon. Uh, and then when you think you're in a good position for the bird to make its attack, then you can take the hood off, the bird will register the prey, see the prey, m and make the attack. One prized Elizabethan falcon was the peregrine, swift and powerful. Once released, the chase was on. It was now up to the bird to follow and catch the prey. For the falconer, there was concern that he might never see his prized bird again. The chase continued until the falcon caught its prey and they both came to earth to be retrieved by the falconer. The speed of the chase, sometimes over difficult ground, was a great test of riding ability and one which Elizabethan men and women entered into with great enthusiasm. Falconry was popular throughout the Middle Ages and continues to this day. A bird of prey's acute sight and speed are used by man to reach the prey that he cannot. Maintaining the bird's natural hunting instinct is part of the falconer's skill. It requires a feeding routine that stimulates the bird's hunting instinct without weakening it by underfeeding. In medieval times, they used to use a system called waking, and this was to uh, keep the bird on the hand, as I have him here, with a hood on. Um, not normally feed him for 72 hours, but keep him on the hand and moving so he couldn't go to sleep. <clears throat> At the end of the 72 hours, of course, he was tired or she was tired, and she had a fairly good appetite. Uh, you'd normally then take the hood off and use that appetite to start to work with it. Once the bird's tame, and that normally takes around seven days, 
then you're going to start to ask it to do other things. And you're going to use a thing called a creance, which is just a light line. Um, first of all, you're going to ask it to jump from a perch just a few feet to show that it's confident enough approaching a big predator like yourself. The bird's confidence is built up by flying to the glove on a light line called a creance. In the next stage, the bird covers greater distances without a creance. The bird cannot see its prey, in this case the lure, until the hood is removed. The lure is made to imitate the prey and has a small piece of food attached to it. It's swung in the air to attract the bird's attention. And all you're doing is you're not training it to do anything. All you're doing is just, you're just borrowing its, uh, it, its, its normal hunting technique. The lure is swung around and the bird swoops to it, its mock prey. The exercise is patiently repeated, building up the relationship between man and bird, a time-consuming process to train a unique hunting weapon. By the 18th century, shooting birds in flight was a new and challenging sport for gentlemen. But the flintlock shotgun had a disadvantage that those gentlemen hunters were keen to solve. The firing mechanism on the gun had a tendency to scare the birds off. A particular problem for sportsmen using early firearms, particularly when they're firing at birds on the wing, was that the external priming powder would cause a puff and flash as it went off momentarily before the main charge and a bird flying through the air some distance away would see that and jink or turn away sharply. Shooting birds on the wing with a flintlock or with any of the earlier firearms was a notoriously difficult thing to do. A number of 18th century gunsmiths had tried to devise ways to stop the ignition mechanism warning the birds. One passionate hunter, the Reverend Alexander Forsyth, was determined to solve the problem. He was encouraged and supported by the military authorities at the Tower of London. Some of his first ideas have survived in these very early engineering drawings and illustrations. Forsyth's hard work at the Tower of London produced a very elegant solution to the problem. This is one of the experimental pieces which he made while at the Tower of London in 1806. It's simply a modified flintlock mechanism. He's taken away the flintlock cock and replaced it with a simple hammer. And this is the critical part. It's a small rotating magazine, which we tend to call a scent bottle. And the locks are often known now as scent bottle locks, which contains a small amount of this very volatile fulminate powder. And here we've got one of the later pistols which Forsyth produced, a dueling pistol using his scent bottle lock. The hammer is brought to half cock. And then this, the, the little magazine, has a quantity of fulminate powder near the bottom. By pressing a little catch and rotating the magazine back, a small amount of fulminate drops onto a little spindle here. Rotating the magazine back brings the striker in line with the small amount of fulminate left on the axle. And then simply by full cocking and allowing the hammer to fall onto the striker, it explodes the fulminate, which then connects with the main charge in the barrel. There's no external smoke and that overcame many of the problems for the sportsmen of that puff of powder smoke from the priming. Unfortunately for Alexander Forsyth, his work at the tower, although quite promising, was supported by uh, an outgoing member of the military authorities, and unfortunately the new regime thought nothing of his work and told him and his rubbish to leave the Tower of London. Unfortunately, that meant that uh, the military authorities in Britain didn't benefit from uh, uh, Forsyth's work and he went off into London and, and set up in business on his own. The final solution was the percussion cap, a metal cap filled with a very small amount of the volatile and inflammable fulminate powder. No more flash, no more loose gunpowder, no danger of wind and rain spoiling the ignition of the priming charge. Until the late 19th century, shooting any sort of bird was thought fair sport, and water birds were considered particularly good eating by the rich diners of Victorian London. This enormous percussion cap gun was specially made for shooting flocks of duck on the water. It was designed to fire one massive charge of shot that could kill up to several hundred birds. 
but loading it was a lengthy process. First, powder is dropped down the barrel. The sheer size of the gun means a lot of time and patience is required. A wad is inserted to keep the powder in place. It has to be rammed carefully several feet down the long barrel. Finally, a large charge of lead shot, up to six ounces, is loaded into the barrel. The gun is mounted on a water-hugging punt that floats easily in shallow water. It keeps a very low profile as it moves quietly with the tides and under cover of the rushes and mudflats in the estuary without disturbing the birds. These extraordinary percussion cap guns were used by sportsmen and by commercial hunters who needed or wanted to bag large numbers of birds. They only had the chance to fire once. It could take several hours at night, at dusk, or in the very early morning to get within range of enough birds. Care and patience were necessary. A wasted shot could not be repeated. The long trip back to dry land to reload could take hours. It was a sport or business that only the hardiest contemplated. Teal, mallard, goose, muscovy duck, widgeon, and many more could be targets and punt guns accounted for enormous numbers of them. But for all its power, the punt gun had limited range and accuracy because it was a smoothbore, a giant shotgun. Many years before, gun makers, spurred on by the demands of hunters for greater accuracy, had begun to apply their ingenuity to solving this problem. From the first time that firearms appear on the hunting field, we know that hunters were trying to improve the accuracy of their weapons. They were trying to equal the accuracy of the bowmen of previous centuries. And the problem with using a smoothbore barrel and a solid lead ball was that it gave only limited accuracy. At greater ranges, it was very difficult to strike a small target, especially a moving one. It was the longbow that, for hundreds of years, had been the most effective projectile weapon and early gun makers must have observed that the arrow always spins, as seen here with the slow motion camera. And this may have been the key to its remarkable accuracy. Early in the 16th century, somebody, and we don't know yet who, started to experiment with cutting spiral grooves into the inside of a smoothbore barrel. And by taking a lead ball and wrapping it in cloth and forcing it down the barrel, on firing that ball would spin rather like a spinning top on a table. And that spinning effect kept the ball flying more accurately than balls had previously. And we know this rifle, for example, is in the early 17th century, and we can see that the strength of the rifling in the grooves. The rifling on this sporting gun was years ahead of contemporary military firearms, as commanders had been skeptical about the advantage even with constant practice, early rifles took longer than muskets to load. This was seen as a serious disadvantage for a soldier, but was no drawback for the hunter, who had plenty of time to load his weapon. Rifling doesn't actually increase the velocity of a firearm or make it any more powerful, but it gives accuracy to the firearm. Whereas previously, when guns were smooth-bored, um, they just weren't very accurate. Ah! We can look at the brown bess. The only effectiveness that you actually got there was the sheer mass of lead that you were throwing at the enemy. But with the advent of rifling, by imparting a twist on the bullet, it allows it to give an accurate flight from the rifle to the target.
This American Pratt & Whitney rifling machine from Hartford, Connecticut, is over 100 years old and is still turning out precision barrels, though it took time to figure out how to get the best out of it. It was difficult for us when we started. The first machines that we actually had was a hand-operated machine, and I think uh, it took us a week to build one barrel. And even at that stage, you know, right on the last cuttings, we may have got it wrong, you know, and uh, we would have to start all over again. The science of rifling is complicated. Grooves can be deep or shallow, and the number of grooves cut depends on the type of projectile. Nowadays, the method that we use is cut rifling, and it is actually a hook cutter, a single point broaching tool, which we feed on a very small amount after each groove has been cut. And it takes a long time to do. It's probably the slowest method of any of the rifling techniques that are being used nowadays but a lot of people still consider it to be the most accurate form of rifling that you can produce. These new barrels waiting to be machined are at the heart of the sporting gun. They will give the sportsman unrivaled opportunities to pursue his passion for hunting dangerous animals. But they do so only because of another improvement, this time in the projectile. To be sure of shooting an animal at long range, you need not only rifling, but a bullet that is stable in flight, so that the spin imparted by the rifling can have its full effect. The change from round ball to aerodynamic bullet in the mid-19th century opened the whole world to the hunter. With a reliable, accurate and powerful weapon, he was able to take on any challenge that nature could throw his way. There wasn't an animal alive that could deter him. The uncharted and sometimes dangerous territories of the new and expanding colonial empires offered challenges he couldn't resist. His personal comfort and safety mattered little. The drive was to test his courage and his shooting skills. For the first time, it was possible for a single hunter to dominate the animal kingdom. More sportsmen wanted to shoot the largest and most dangerous animals. Firearms development continued to be driven forward by the consequent demand for bigger and more powerful weapons. The largest that we know of that was produced at that time was this rifle, which was produced by Holland and Holland in London in 1880. And in 1887 was taken to Africa by Ewart Grogan in his epic journey from the Cape to Cairo, from the south to the north of the continent. And we know he certainly shot rhinoceros with it. Well, the rifle is perfectly conventional in the way that it operates. Simply a rotary underlever, which opens the breech, placing a cartridge or both cartridges in, snapping the breech shut and closing the lever. Big game hunting with powerful rifles in the 19th and early 20th centuries was the pastime of the rich and influential. But for some hunters, killing wild and rare species with big guns was becoming too easy. There was less need for the real personal courage that had always characterized hunting down the ages. In the end, the skill of the gun makers almost spoiled the sport. Some hunters in the 19th century had a desire to return to the true spirit of hunting testing themselves with a horse and a simple spear, just as their medieval forebears had done. Many of these big game hunters were military men on leave from their regiments. The developing colonial empires of the European powers gave them ample opportunity to indulge their passion for hunting, a passion that the military authorities actively encouraged, as they always have. For they recognized that the patience, skill, endurance and courage developed when chasing dangerous animals, made hunting the best possible practice for war. There's a close connection across much of history between war and hunting. 
In part, that comes out in the terminology, regarding the enemy almost as a dangerous game and describing making a bigger bag. There's also the question of doing a risky sport, because a risky sport keeps you fit and mentally alert. Um, war is almost substituted for by sport when there's no war happening. So very dangerous sports like pig sticking, uh, which is collective because you need a team, uh, which is competitive because the object is to get first spear, the first man to actually touch the ball with a spear is the person who wins. So it's collective, it's competitive, and above all it's dangerous. So it's something for warriors to do when they're not actually at war. It's always been the same. As King John I of Portugal elegantly put it early in the 15th century, hunting is a training for all types of fighting met with in war, a better training than jousting. If the tournament teaches a man how to strike with a sword on a helmet, how much better he will learn by striking down a boar when his only chance of saving himself is by a good thrust with a spear. <laughs>